Now we're going to briefly review male dog anatomy and then talk about semen collection and evaluation. So the anatomy of the male dog consists of two testes with associated epididymes, and the epididymes are pieces of tissue that wrap around the testis, and that's where sperm is matured and stored. Those are within a scrotum, which is a thinly haired sac that hangs outside of the dog. And that's important because testicles will not function if they're too warm. So that's why they hang outside of the body in the scrotum. The penis of the dog lies within a haired sheath called the prepuce. So if you look at the bottom of your dog, that's what you're looking at is his prepuce. Penis lies within that, although he can freely move it in and out of that prepuce. And the most important thing to understand about the dog penis is that it has a bone within it that allows him to introduce the penis into the female before it's fully erect. And that when it is fully erect, the part nearest his body will become greatly engorged compared to the rest of the penis. That's what gets caught within the lips of the vulva of the female to form the tie or copulatory lock that we talked about when we talked about natural breeding. And then finally, be aware that all mammals have what are called accessory sex glands, and those are what produce the fluid part of semen. So semen is the fluid from the accessory sex glands plus the sperm, which is coming from the epididymis and the testis. And in dogs, the only accessory sex gland they have is the prostate gland. So the picture there on the left is showing you a normal testis. This was a, a testis that was removed at the time of castration. So what you're seeing is that nice round testis and that sort of shelf of tissue over the top of it that the black arrow is pointing to is the epididymis. There's one on each side, one for each testis. And that tube then continues as a smaller tube that runs up into that tissue that you're seeing moving away. That's the tube that would connect it up into the urethra so that sperm could be moved out of the testis and epididymis and dumped into the urethra for ejaculation. And that piece of tissue also contains the blood vessels for the testis. So that's what we call the spermatic cord. The picture on the right is an ultrasound of the testis. And that's showing you this sort of nice, even, mottled texture of the testis with a big, bright, white echo in the middle. And that white echo is where all of those separate little pieces of testicular tissue, what we call the seminiferous tubules, all of them producing sperm, dump into a central collecting duct in the middle. That's what gives us that bright white echo that then connects out to the epididymis. The testicles develop originally up by the kidney. So during embryologic development, they start out up by the kidney. And what happens first is that the testis is sort of held in place. The body moves around it. So as the dog's body grows, that sort of moves the testicle back just because the dog grows away from the testicle. And then the gubernaculum, which is sort of a gelatinous tissue connected to the testis, first grows and then shrinks. And that helps pull the testes all the way down into the scrotum. And there are a variety of factors that control that, including genetics and hormones and physical properties like the weight and size of the testis. And we'll talk about that more when we talk specifically about testicular disorders in another session. This is a normal erect dog penis, and so first of all, notice it has sort of a weird lavender color, and that's a normal color for an erect dog penis. There are three parts of the penis. The arrow is pointing at the bulbous glandus. That's that portion nearest the body that just gets huge. Bulbous means barrel, and it's just this huge barrel-shaped piece of tissue that get caught within the lips of the vulva of the female that they tie with when they're being naturally bred. And then there's the shaft of the penis, and the very end is what's called the glands of the penis. And this is the prostate. This is an ultrasound of the prostate. And what you're seeing here is a dark shadow down the middle. That's the urethra. And that's because the prostate sits around the urethra. If this is the urinary bladder, as the urethra empties, the prostate sits right at that neck of the urinary bladder. And again, that's so that fluid can be dumped down into the urethra. So at the time of ejaculation, fluid coming from the testes mixes with fluid coming from the prostate, and that's what forms the semen that will be ejaculated. We collect and evaluate semen for a couple of different reasons. One reason would be for breeding soundness exam. So if we need to know if a male is capable of breeding, sometimes we'll be asked to do this for the American Kennel Club or other organizations to see if a male could have fathered a litter of puppies. Sometimes we'll do it because a dog is going to be sold. Sometimes we'll do it because somebody wants to do something with that semen, like freeze semen, and we need to make sure the quality is good enough to withstand that. 
When we collect semen, we use a process called manual ejaculation, meaning we do not use electrical stimulation, anything like that. It's just getting a well-trained dog excited and then capturing the semen as he ejaculates it. I like to use the piece of, t of equipment shown here, which is a rubber collecting cone attached to a centrifuge tube. You can also buy polypropylene or polystyrene pieces of equipment that are shaped just like this that are one big continuous unit. Everybody has sort of their own way that they like to do it. Some people will do it where they don't use any sort of collecting cone and just have a cup and they ejaculate the, the dog into the cup. I don't like that as well because you risk contaminating the semen, you risk spilling the semen. So I like to use a more contained unit so I know for sure I'm not going to adulterate that semen sample and I'm not going to lose that semen sample. To manually ejaculate the dog, you feel along their prepuce until you feel their bulbous glandus, which is always a little bit bigger than the rest of the shaft of their penis. And then you're going to want to massage them over that area briskly and enthusiastically until you just start to feel them become erect. And then at that point, you sort of squeeze on the back of your penis with your one hand so that it pushes it out of the prepuce and use your collecting instrument to push the prepuce back with the other hand. Because your goal is to get that whole prepuce back beyond the bulbous glandus so the dog doesn't become erect within the prepuce because that will be painful to him. Most well-trained dogs respond to this very well. They understand exactly what you're doing and most of the time you're able to get that back fairly readily. At this point, the dog will usually be thrusting fairly vigorously. You might want to have a teaser bitch there. You might want to make sure you have a good surface for him to stand on. So you'll see here this dog is standing on a rug, and that's nice because that gives him a little bit of footing, and if he tries to mount up onto that female or otherwise come up onto his hind legs, you want to make sure he's not going to spread eagle out and hurt himself. So they will ejaculate their semen in three fractions. First will be a clear pre-sperm fraction, which probably just serves to clean out the urethra. Second will be a sperm-rich fraction that comes from the testis and epididymis, and they will usually ejaculate these two fractions while they are vigorously thrusting. And then the dog will usually stop for a minute, and at this point, you can turn their penis around. Don't twist it, so if you're aiming it forwards, just bring it all the way around. Let their legs step over your arm, so you're aiming their penis caudally or backwards. And then at this point, they will ejaculate the third fraction, which is pure prostatic fluid. And during the tie, that prostatic fluid would be helping move the sperm forward in the bitch's reproductive tract. Once you're getting that fluid, you'll see it coming into the tube as a clear stream of fluid. You'll feel it in the hand that's holding the AV as these distinct pulsations, and the dog will usually contract their anus at the same time. And once you've got that, you know you aren't going to get any more sperm, and you can be done with the collection and just gently peel that AV down off of his penis. So what do we do to evaluate the semen once we have it? So you can see here there's a whole list of things that we can use to try to help us evaluate the quality of the semen. The truth of the matter is the only way to really evaluate the quality of the semen is to breed him to somebody and see if she gets pregnant. So just be aware that all of these indicators are just sort of a guess for us, a best guess of what sort of quality we need to be likely to get females pregnant. But none of the testing that we do actually tells us if those sperm can fertilize eggs. So the first thing we'll look at is color. Normal color is what we call opalescent, which is sort of milky colored. You don't want clear, that means there's no sperm in there. You don't want yellow, that means there's urine contamination in there. Red or brown means there's blood in there, and green means there's pus. And either red or brown or green usually means you have prostate disease that you would go searching for. So our goal is for it to be sort of milky colored. We always measure the volume, although the volume is not dependent on the dog, it's dependent on whoever collected the dog. So for me, if I happen to be chatting with the client and I collect more of that prostatic fluid, then I'm obviously going to have a larger volume. And that had nothing to do with the dog. It had to do with how long I held on and collected prostatic fluid. But we always measure the volume because we're going to use it later on to tell us how many sperm are in that ejaculate. pH is something that we don't very often measure because we don't have a good way to measure it accurately in the general clinic, and it doesn't really provide us with great information that we would use to treat a dog, for example. Motility is motion or movement of the sperm. Normal motility in dogs would be greater than 70% of the sperm moving forward. And generally, dogs either have clearly normal motility or clearly abnormal motility. To assess this, the veterinarian will put a drop of semen on a slide and just look at it under the microscope and then just make a subjective assessment of what percentage of them are moving forward. 
concentration we measure by using a diluting mechanism, so we don't have to count all of the sperm. We count a sample and then mathematically extrapolate how many there are. And that's because normal ejaculates in dogs will have between 300 million and 2 billion sperm in them. So clearly it's advantageous to only have to count 250 or something and then mathematically extrapolate it out. The concentration that we measure will give us how many millions of sperm there are per mil. So if you take millions per mil, and multiply that by your volume, mils in the ejaculate. That will give you millions in the ejaculate, or total number. And that's the valuable number, because that's what the dog did. I controlled the volume, I controlled the concentration. The dog is the one who gave us the total number. And so that's the valuable number for us. That's the 300 million to 2 billion that we're looking for. Another thing we will often check is morphology or shape of the sperm. And as you might imagine, if the sperm are abnormally shaped, that is going to affect their ability to be modal or to move. And that's also going to impact their ability to reach the egg and be able to fertilize it. Sometimes people will ask me, if the sperm are abnormally shaped, does that mean we're going to have abnormal puppies? And the answer is no. The puppies are developed from the DNA that's within that sperm. The sperm is really just a transport vehicle for that DNA. So the, really the biggest concern for us is can that sperm get the DNA to the egg to make it into a puppy? That's the biggest concern. And then finally, we will occasionally look at the cells that are within that semen or culture that semen, and that's especially if we're looking for particular signs of disease. So we'll talk about that more when we talk about things like prostate disease. This is showing you the three fractions of the ejaculate, nicely labeled there on the tubes for you. So number one is that pre-sperm ejaculate, which is clear. Number two is the sperm rich that comes from the testes and epididymis and has that nice milky color to it. And then finally, the prostatic fluid again. The third fraction is a clear fraction. This is showing you the equipment that we use when we do that concentration measurement. We dilute it into that vessel, then we put it onto this hemocytometer, which has a grid etched into it that you can see under the microscope. So you can count the number of sperm within that grid and then mathematically figure out how many sperm are there in the ejaculate. And then these are examples of two different ways that we assess morphology. The one with the darker background is an eosin nigrosin, or India ink type of stain. And then the one on the lower side there is what's called a diff quick stain. That's the one that's probably more commonly done because that's the same kind of stain we use for vaginal cytology or to look at other cytologies in veterinary practice. And what we're really looking for are for sperm that have a nice normal round head and a nice long fairly straight tail. And you can see looking at this, we have for example on the eosin nigrosin stain slide, uh, one sperm with two tails and we have down on the diff quick stain slide some sperm with very coiled tails. And those sort of abnormalities give your veterinarian idea, do we have an infection present? Is there something else I need to be investigating? Could this dog get females pregnant or not with sperm with those abnormalities? And with that, I am happy to answer any questions you may have.